three, two, one, and welcome back to Chasing the Racing episode 37, and we're joined by Mr. James Whitham down at, uh, is it the Huddersfield International Airport? Oh yeah, we're international now. <laughs> uh, we realised that we had uh, once uh, taken a flight, somebody had flown in from France in a, in a small aircraft, so we figured we were international at that point. <laughs> So we have our uh, Terminal 2, um, Terminal, well, we're talking about caravans here. Terminal <laughs> 1 blew away in a big storm. Uh, so the next caravan we got is obviously Terminal 2. It's all sign written. We've got, you know, uh, 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 we've got departures, arrivals, <laughs> we've got baggage collection on the same door. <laughs> well, I, I love the security guy and the guy on the way in, high vase, woolly hat, <laughs> and oh, a that... big walking stick going, hello, son, can we <laughs> yeah, help? Yeah, 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 that's, oh, well, that's, we uh, that's somebody who keeps their horse up here, actually. <laughs> yeah, he used to build tractors for a living, that bloke. Anyway, it must have been a mega place to grow up around here. You know, like, it's it's like a bloke's dream, and it motorbikes, planes, plenty of land to do what you want. Yeah, that, I mean, I, we, did, um, we were reasonably deprived in a lot of ways, but uh, to be honest, being brought up with space is something that a lot of people don't. In fact, people yeah. are used to not having space now. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, the people are tripping over each other. Your garden, you know, backs onto somebody else's garden. You make a bit of a noise and a bit of a smell, and they don't like it. And they have a fire, <laughs> and your washing smells, and all that kind of thing. And we didn't get any of that up here. We could pretty much do uh, within reason what we wanted. Mm-hmm. And uh, have you have you been into flying from a young age? Obviously, I know I've been in a chat show before when you've talked about the you know the story with Shuey picking up that plane years and years ago. Is when did you first start flying? Um, I, my dad, my dad moved in here. My dad bought this place in the early seventies purely because he'd learnt to fly in the sixties and got right into it. His business was doing all right. Bought the airfield. We moved in up here, and so I've been around flying a long, long time. The problem for me with the flying early on was that I was into motorbikes really heavily. Was your dad ever into bikes? Yeah, my right. dad was big old motorbiker. Yeah, yeah. He took me to see. The race meets went to Maori Park, Alton Park, went to stuff like um, Transatlantic, and first went to his first TT in '78 for Hillwood's return, and from that, I mean, even before that, I was into bikes. We had field bikes up here, and mates of mine had buy old Bantams and old C90s and stuff, and because their parents didn't agree with them having it, or they didn't have any room to keep them because <laughs> they lived in the council house, they'd leave them up here. So on a weekend, you get a troop of kids who may or may not have been my friend. You know, some lads I didn't even get on with that well, but they'd get the bike up here because they didn't have anywhere else and they'd come up and ride it on a weekend. So so you were the local kingpin in the, in the school In the then, bikey you know I mean? type thing, yeah. That's I was, brilliant. Yeah, I really so was, like, yeah. Okay, let's, go, let's go have a chat with Whitham there. He's our mate. He's always our mate. <laughs> a gang of lads arrived and uh, they'd knock on the door. My mum and said, oh, all right, lads, how are you doing? Yeah, James in. Um, yeah, yeah, he is, but he's just he's almost doing something with his dad on on the farm. Uh, but he, he, his motorbike's broken down. You don't have a motorbike at the minute. It's not running. All oh, right, then we'll see you then. <laughs> <Off they went>. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, obviously, we'll come on to speaking about your racing career and stuff and like stuff in the past. But uh, what are you up to mainly these days? Obviously, the, you've got the commentating and the the track days things. Uh, like, how do you fill your time? Uh, the well, about time. This man doesn't have time. He's he's always busy. No, he, this is a, this is a really good time of year, of year for me to have time and make sure I do have a little bit of time this time of year for mountain biking, bit of trails riding, and stuff I want to do. <laughs> but the work thing is mainly summer for me. I've got a um, couple of three properties I rent out. I try and get a bit more time into them in winter because they naturally get neglected because yes. I'm away a lot in summer. So I try and keep up to them in winter. Uh, anything needs doing to the airfield, we'll try and get that done this time of year. I try and do a little bit of restoration work in my workshops because I love doing it and I don't get that much chance in summer. So it's um, more my stuff in winter than it is in summer for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, how's the sort of track and training days going? Have, have you got plenty of dates booked in for next year and stuff? Yeah, 22 again uh, in 2020. Uh, usual places for us. So we're running at um, Croft, Mallory and Anglesey. Um and they're going well. Uh, we, I'm just, I've just got the new GSXR seven, um, thousands through, and a little bit of prep, uh, and we're ready to go, really. And just for the uh, the track day people that are listening, the uh, do you want to just sort of briefly explain what you, what you provide us for on the track days? Yeah, it's um, it's ca- 
call it what you want, it, it, it's really a low numbers track day. I realised when I was running a company called Speed Freak with a guy called Paul Shooksmith, we were a pretty standard Stackham and Rackham track day. If we got 150 people booked on it, Cadwell, we would accept 150 people at Cadwell, which meant through your three groups, you're having 50 and 60 on track sometimes, which is brilliant. And this firm's doing a really good job of that. But we realized most of the hassle we got on the day and most of the hassle people had between each other on the day was purely because there were a lot of people there. So you'd go out and within a lap, there'd be a red flag because somebody had gone out to the grass at all bends and tipped off. And then there'd be another red flag because somebody dropped some oil and then there'd be... and it. Is that, is that the legal limit? No, I'm just Whatever thinking, the legal when... limit was, yeah, each track has its own limit. Right, so I'm thinking, obviously, you're, let, let's talk about Croft. So how many people can you have on at Croft? I don't know, because I actually don't know at Croft now. Oh, I don't right. know what the limits are anyway, but I know it's a lot. Right, so it's a for, lot. For a competitive race day, on a, say if there's different limits, so, and I don't know who sets these, it may even be the ACU, but say, for example, at Cadwell, I think, the limit to start a race... Is thirty two on the grid. That's what I mean. Where you where we're definitely used to those numbers, and you think that's 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 a busy track. But I think it's what they do is it's thirty two for a race. Say for example, Cadwell. Yeah. Uh, and it was thirty six or thirty eight in practice. So if if it wasn't a race, you could put more on, and a track day was even more. So I think you could get. I think Cadwell's limit, and I, this is all kind of made up, but I think it's somewhere near. Yeah. Because I'm not in touch with that now, because I don't have to be, because we run low numbers. Um, I think you're allowed on a track day to put about 50 people and, and more at some places. Bloody Less hell, like travelling up the M6 at rush hour. Busy. Uh, <laughs> and, then, but, and then on top of that, you've got all the like the top riders as sort of coaches, and so everyone on the track day is entitled to sort of tuition. Yeah, so we'll, 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 I'll never put more than 20 on track. So you maximum our maximum number to have on the day is sixty, split into three groups, and each each session each session will have two groups of ten maximum. Mm. Typically, it's a typically say for example, Chrissy, you came and did some instructing for us. Oh, you dumb. Oh, there's a hint. Right? No, he knows what you he's doing. You would <laughs> you would be allocated depending on how the numbers worked out, between seven and ten, ten maximum people, and you'd be with them all day. So you'd have 20 minutes on track with them, and then you'd have probably a 10-minute rest, cup of tea that we provide, bottle of water, get your bikes back on it, get your bikes on the tyre warmers, and then probably a 20-minute debrief, looking at a map, talking about braking, talking about tyres, talking about whatever you want. Mm. But you're with those riders all day, so it's... It's kind of an, it's as intense as you want to make it. If you don't want to sit through the debriefings, perfect. We so don't care. It's sort of a little bit more expensive, but you're getting a lot more like sort of bang for your buck. Type yeah, of. that's it. You're getting less numbers on track, which attracts some people because they are nervous of going on track with 60 other people. Mm-hmm. And as well as that, you get a lot more instruction. And it's, we rarely get, and I'm not speaking too soon, obviously, but we rarely get. Um, big accidents we get the odd person go on grass we get the odd person slide off but we do really well with it purely because we don't stick a lot of people on track mm-hmm. and uh just on the way over here we've just come from sort of doncaster area and uh so is it, would, would that be huddersfield town center that we've just come through yes yes yeah, yeah so and uh we passed a, a shop there kawasaki shop i'm not sure what it was called but uh I, I recognized it for, is that where you did that tv advert when you took that, the the blog on brilliant. the back yeah, uh, that, that'll be a shop corner. It's called Earnshaw's. It's right next door to a big wick store. Uh, just, just bef- you would pass it on the way into town from here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, it's about half a mile from town and about a mile and a half from here. And that is, they're, they're, they're my really good mates who run that place. Mm-hmm. That you you wouldn't get away with doing that. that, that, that I was, I was just about to say, why don't we do that sort of thing now? The industry's can't becoming always it. PC. It's, it's terrible, man. Can't do it, can't it? It's like, it's like um, we were discussing, um, I'm not sure if it was on the pod or not, but we're talking about like Fast Bike magazine and how in the centre page, they used to have like a girl there draped over a Honda Fireblade in her knickers. The only reason I bought that magazine was because to get the... Di- I'm a total pervert, <laughs> yeah. young and I totally hate the hard beats like the rest of us males. <laughs> but you just think, those adverts that you did, they are going to be literally timeless yeah, because they won't happen again. You can't, w- you can't do it again. The, the problem with that was we we were working for a magazine at the time. We came up with a lot of ideas. And this is in the... You know, kind of... It was the laddish kind of 90s. You know, it was Aye. where you could... 
you were expected to be a dickhead. Then. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now everybody yes. has to be a bit more responsible, and we've oh. got to. And, I, and I, I get it. I do get it. Do you we, think that's crap? Quick question. Uh, do you think that's. No, come on. No, you see, hold on. I keep forgetting. We're, we're speaking to Jamie with me. And now, of any listeners who haven't heard of this name, you've been living under a rock and you need to get out underneath it. <laughs> I'm telling you. The thing is, you've. And I've never wanted to hurt anybody. But I wasn't as bothered about hurting myself back then. And yeah. I, th- I I firmly believe if you want to go out and do something, and you'll, you'll get this, you're flipping, you race a TT at really good speed, right? So why would somebody have the right to stop you doing what you want to do when only you are in danger? You I chose to do that. Totally if you want to be agree. a boxer, uh, a, a, a flipping MMA fighter, a rock climber, one of these guys who puts a winged suit on, they smash into the hillside on a regular basis. Good luck to them. Good right. luck to them. Because once you, once you can stop somebody doing what is only what doesn't endanger anybody else, only them, then everything stops. Mm-hmm. What Life sense stops. does? Yeah, exactly. And, and so you know, for me, we did a lot of daft things with the magazine, but it really, it was only only us could have got. That, that's it. But like we're just seeing how that won't even repeat. So if you could you start, if you, now. Wait, that just won't happen again, which is a damn shame. And you just think, what? <laughs> You've just said the exact same point. Why can't we do things like that? We should do something like that, Chrissy. You know. <laughs> well, I think it's gone. For me, it's where does it stop? We all health and safety is a thing you need. You need. We've all got our own health and safety yeah. uh, gene. You know, area of your brain where you survival. Think, it's self survival. Yeah, I'm not sure this is a good idea. There's always some kid at bat when you're eight. And some, some mate comes up with a, a really bad idea of doing something quite dangerous. There's always some kid at back going, I don't like it. I don't, my mum's not going to like this. And then they can always, you can always talk them into it. And that's the thing. That's, that's what you've got. You've got a little kid going, I don't like this. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. And, I, you know, we need, once you, for me, kids now are almost the way that they don't think anything can be dangerous and they don't oh. accept that anything's their fault. My kid, my kid's a good kid. I brought her up best I can. You were telling her she can fly a plane. Yeah, There's yeah, not many can, kids that could fly a plane. She could fly plane. a little bit. And she, could, she could drive when she was eight or nine, only because we had room. I'm not, I had this in, yeah. sure enough, you just, you know, we had her in tractors and on motorbikes. Got your own international you, airport, you know what I mean? Correct. <laughs> but she will still say to me, well, that wasn't my fault. I'm going, no, Ruby, it was exactly your fault. It was exactly your fault. And as a kid, you've got to learn... You've got to have your own, no matter what the government says, or a bloke in Ivy's jacket and an hard hat, you need your own risk assessment thing going on because you, if you don't know that falling up, uh, climbing up a tree and falling out is going to hurt you, well, you're thick. A- a- amen to that. Mm-hmm. You know, you need... And what we're breeding it out of kids now. It's like if you stick a... People used to not trip up Aye. over small steps in a pavement... And the reason they didn't is because they watched where they were going. Not only that, you'd feel like a dick. If you walked into Correct. a bar and went, here, I've fallen over, you'd be like, you bell end, what are yeah. you doing? <laughs> now, it's somebody else's fault. They want Everybody's looking for somebody else to blame. Well, actually, uh, it wasn't my fault. That's t- 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 oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, blame, it's, a, it's almost like this um, American attitude yeah. of, you can put suing it, and, suing and everything mm. in it, and you're thinking, I wish I caught none of that, I would have paid for me racing years ago, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, the biggest mistake my mum did was me, and she <laughs> yeah, should have yeah. put a claim in a long time ago. <laughs> you're never going to get paid out. <laughs> get but, a spade. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, you, you, I think the health and safety thing for me has gone quite a long way. You know, we we got, um, I, I won't go too far into it, but we are bound by the CA uh, as who was in charge of, of flying. Obviously, they are safety conscious. There's lots of red tape surrounding it, and quite rightly, metal bricks flying through the air. Correct. You don't want to if this thing's going to fall out of the sky. You know, I get it. I uh. do get it. But then, when and not by them actually. How can I say this without incriminating myself? Yeah, man, it's it's already it's already <laughs> our podcast. We, say what we you are, want. We've got a public toilet up here for anybody who flies in. Basically, we and we don't get a lot of flights in, but in summer, why get two or three people flying in for a cup of tea because they want to and they uh, want to fly their airplane. They want to and and quick quick fire question: Who's the most famous person you've had land here? Just a quick one, Queen. 
Okay, we're going to come back to this later on. Carry on with your story. You have had some real famous people in here. The Queen, because you're visiting local. Jesus. Queen, uh, <laughs> Prince what... Andrew, uh, Mike Ashley. Bloody yeah. hell! Did he it, comes Prince in. Prince Andrew didn't have. Uh, he didn't land in Epstein's plane, did he? <laughs> no, he didn't. He landed in a huge helicopter with his two kids. Is it Eugenie and Beatrice? I have Maybe no idea. I've just got this fantastic image of Wallace going to use your local throne. <laughs> Tony Blair. Tony Blair landed. Oh, there was a bit of, there was a little bit of trouble there. Uh, uh, Tony Blair, we had um, Mick Jagger. Get Shut up, man. Yeah. Mick Jagger's got relatives. You are literally the Mick most. Mick Jagger has relatives locally. He came in with a big airplane. Right, you are literally the most rock, sc- like rock star <laughs> rider that's ever, ever existed. Anyway, sorry, we've totally interrupted, Mike, right? So you Mike, got- Ashley, Mike Ashley left his, left his, well, he wanted his helicopter. He were going to, he, Mike Ashley were going to watch Newcastle play Huddersfield in the Premiership two years ago. He'd been in twice, actually, when they played. Who won? Yeah. Def- definitely Newcastle. I'm not a big thing. football no, fan. No, Newcastle are you a football thing. fan? No, no, I like to see town doing well, but I think Newcastle... Uh, kicked his ass that weekend. Fantastic. <laughs> but he left, the, when they'd gone, this helicopter was somewhat special. It was a charter firm helicopter. One of I don't think it was Anyway, I went up to it and have a look. Door open. Oh, yes. So I'm signing it. I'm having a seat in it like a kid going, eh. <laughs> Anyway, that's probably illegal. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Go, <laughs> going back to health and safety, I know yep. I know we had a big crack about this before we started recording, and uh, but I just think it's such a good story that uh, our listeners would really enjoy it. Could you just uh, tell us about when you went to pick up your first plane with, with oh, Shuey? I had a really good friend at the time uh, who got killed at the Isle of Man three years ago, a guy called Paul Shoesmith, funny, the funniest lad you'll ever meet. Little dwarf of a bloke. My favourite levers he ever had were the evil Knievel levers. Yeah, he had a, he had a tassly evil Knievel. Down yeah. Bray Hill with tassels yeah, yeah. flying around the place. Yeah. Well, I mean, his whole life was like that. He's second-hand car salesman, could talk the flipping nine legs off a donkey. You couldn't not like him. And you couldn't upset him. Didn't matter how much you took the mick. He was Teflon, bulletproof. You couldn't get to him. I tried. Anyway, we learned to fly together. <laughs> and we're in the 30s. We were kids. And we bought this aeroplane, went down in the car, looked at this aeroplane, revved it up a little bit, didn't know what we were doing. Bought this little two-seat aeroplane, the check cleared, the week after the bloke rung us and says, can you get it out of the way, it's yours now, the check's cleared. And we'd arranged for it, we were about halfway through our licences at that time. And uh, we therefore arranged uh, for an older fella who flew from up with us, who had a licence, to come down and make it legal. Ah, so you can actually get, the, yeah. get your plane home. Yeah. Anyway, the night before we were going, uh, Rodney, this guy called Rodney, let us down. He says, I've got some on. It wasn't his fault. He just had some on. Can't go. We'll have to go next weekend. We were so disappointed, like kids at Christmas. We went anyway. And we took this other old boy who's never had a, fly, uh, a pilot's license. But the guy <laughs> we were buying the airplane off didn't know that this other guy, Barry, who was now dead, so he, you can't increment, I can't increment it in. <laughs> um, uh, didn't know Barry didn't have a license so we got this aeroplane and flew it but I'd done I'd done probably 15 or 16 hours so I could actually fly the aeroplane I wasn't uh, teaching I, myself <laughs> as I went I could do I could fly <laughs> treating it like one of your super bikes yeah flat out and lean it back there. but yeah, yeah but we didn't have a map so we went east until we found the A1 this is from Cambridge and then flew north full of the A1 and okay. found his way back that is brilliant <laughs> And it, it, it's great to see you, you, you know, looking so well and healthy. Um, are you, like, obviously after the whole cancer thing, of, are you finished all your chemotherapy now? And yeah, it? I had my last treatment. I had about 18 months of treatment leading up to a thing called a stem cell transplant. Bloody uh, yeah. Which is, uh, it's all right, just a bit boring. You're, in, you're inside for, you have to be in isolation because they eat you with that much chemo that you're very susceptible. The immune system just you gets have no immune system. Bloody That's the whole hell. point. The whole point right. is you build a new immune system up, so it, it kind of flushes you out. That's the idea All of right. any rogue cells. Yeah. So, I, but you, it, the hard bit about the stem cell transplant is that it's it's an undefined amount of time. You go in, the load you came over a week, then you're in isolation. You're basically in a small room with pressure and temperature and air controlled. You know, because if somebody walks in there with a cold, you, you die. Mm-hmm. You get it and you die. That's because it'll kill you. Yeah. So you don't have any well, visitors. Was, okay, well, 
Okay, at that exact point, right, the doctor's going, look, son, if someone sneezes, you know, just have your last moments with yourself. You know, that, yeah, that, I mean, that must have been beyond terrifying, because that's uh, how we no, control. Because the alternative that you're facing at that time is worse. Because yeah. without it, you're dying. Yeah, so, yeah of course, So, yeah. you, you know, you, you do anything, you take anything. You take yeah. any risk, mm -hmm. because the alternative is de uh, definite. Yeah. And the hard bit to accept mentally is the fact that you may be in there for the, the quickest anybody's ever done it is three and a half weeks. Apparently, this is in Leeds. I asked him, what's the record for getting out <laughs> after a stem cell transplant? She's about three and a half weeks, about 24 days, maybe. And I went, right, that's it then. And uh, she says, but we have some in that, you know, three months before you're fit enough. Because they check your blood levels every day. Yeah, just and so. until you're fit enough, levels of white and blood cells and the rest of it, you're not going out. Mm -hmm. But I did it in just under four weeks. So I was kind of all right. Oh, dear. See, all right. this is, like, we talk a lot on this show about like psychological in, mindset is so important in this sport. And now, because of racing, because of your competitive nature, how competitive would you say you are as a person? Be honest with yourself. <laughs> Quite competitive, but yeah. not that one about the competitiveness. No, 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 that no, one no. about. You, Oh yeah, no, no. I'm I'm taking this to a side. I'm just saying, like, we are racing. You know your attitude. You know you get well because you've you've crashed bikes. You've done this. You've yeah, done yeah, that. Yeah. And you just say to yourself, "I need to get better." <laughs> now, how important do you think in any illness, any injury, anything like that? How important is the mindset? It's got to be 100. percent Oh, massively important. Yeah. But I think you you soon learn with racing bikes that you you wouldn't be in the job long if you didn't accept and get through the best way you could yeah injury mm -hmm. you know bodily injury but and that it was pretty much the same i mean i put up with it i put up with the chemo reasonably well and i was i think really lucky in that everybody's different of course you can you have are, the yeah. strongest you know 18 year old kid in the world with lymphoma and it flaws him and uh, you know i was being treated with 70 year old ladies feeble old ladies lovely old lasses who put up with it really well and never complained see that's what i mean weird, we're talking weird. about that, that almost generation side of things just totally gone. Yeah. When, when when you accept it, can, like we know people, I know personally people who have come off a bite once, you know, when they've just le rode it in their head, going, I'm never doing that again. They've just accepted yeah, but defeat. Yeah, different. Of course that's fair enough for them. Of course, it, it, of course it is, yeah. You know, it, that's fair enough. And then, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a weird thing. But it, boredom for me when I were inside was <laughs> the biggest thing. Mm. Yeah. And you know, like I was, I remember speaking to you at um, it was Knock Hill in 2018. I think it was actually during you were either going in for chemo or you just had it or whatever. Yeah. And I remember just being so impressed with your your attitude at yeah. the time. And it was so like matter of fact and get. And I just wonder, did the whole did the whole scenario and uh, all the you know all the shit that you've been through with it has it changed your outlook on life? I changed you a bit. I mean, everybody says it changes you, yeah, and. That, the little things become more important to you in that you, you you appreciate the simpler things that you had taken for granted for years, if you like. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and but like, like my biggest point is that you're such a such a big icon within just the sport, first of all, and your mindset for just illness in general, not just specifically cancer. It's just the yeah, but that's the thing, isn't it? You can't. You know, you. But that's in my opinion. I think looking up to you there, it's just. But you don't choose mindset. here. You don't. No. You don't choose it. It's not like the, the the people I reckon you've got to admire is the people who. If you've got to put up with something, you put up with it. That's it. You don't yeah. get a choice. It's the people for me. The bravery thing, because you know, I've always wondered what what makes a really brave person, right? Because the racing bike thing, I thought I'd, I'd stick my neck out a bit. I thought, you know. That's but a I, different kind of break. We want somebody, to do it. If yeah. somebody picked a fight with me, I'd be the first one flipping on his toes. You know what I mean? I'm not. I'm not. I would. I said I were a brave person. However, you look at people. To me, bravery is not. If you've got to put up with it, if they said to me, "You've got to go back inside because the cancer's back," and this is, yeah, what are you gonna do? Say no. Wait, you can't say no. No, you can't. So nah. Bravery don't come into it. It's, there's no choice. Yeah. It's the people who choose to put their self who didn't have to. They're the ones that, that really you've got to think, well, they're, they're brave people. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, that's fair. That is, that's, soldiers that's... or somebody, imagine a fireman having to run into a building to, to help somebody. You'd be, everything yeah. inside you'd be going, no, it's, no it's, I'm going to get burned yeah. in there. Do you know what I mean? And that's a conscious decision where mine haven't been decisions. Mine's have been, oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. No choice. Yeah. So it's a, it's a weird thing, isn't it? It's that's strange. 
No, thank you. Thank you for that. That was <laughs> oh, bloody hell. Thank you. Going on to <laughs> deep. <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, uh, so do you think? Do you think Hickman's a bill end? You know, <laughs> <laughs> we'll yeah. get it. <laughs> we'll go on to. Um, Onto the your racing career, and yep. uh, um, when was the first time that you you started actually racing bikes? Uh, Sixteen. Uh, uh, really simple story. My dad had a. I'd, I've been on bikes since I was four or five up here, just flying about on anything we could get his hands on. And then my dad's best mate, a guy called Clifford Leach, who lives just over the hill here, near he's he's this side of Halifax and where Halifax side of Huddersfield kind of thing. Mm. Um, he had a lad who was. It was three years older than me, I called Dave Leach, who went on to become a multiple TT winner, cracking rider. Well, he started racing club races at about 17 on a 250LC. And because I was interested in bikes anyway, and I'd been to watch a bit with my dad, uh, I'd go to help Dave. I'd, I was just that 14, 15-year-old kid who did send for, oh, go get us a bag of chips or clean this or fetch that or mix that or do that. And I was a kind of skivvying for them and really enjoying it. So we got a place like Carnaby, Elvington, Cadwell, Mallory, all them sort of places, mm. Croft. And then when I got to 16, I realised there were people at Paddock who were probably that age. And you could only start when you were 16 then. There was no real youth racing. You had to be 16. Right. And um, I said to my dad, I'd like to go racing and... Uh, we came up with a bit of a plan and he bought, uh, he spent 600 quid on a 125 Honda MT, a little proper race bike, but a, quite a basic one. And um, strangely enough, my dad had never taken me racing. He said, oh, I'd go with Dave and he'd drop me off at Dave's. I'd chuck it in his van. And we'd, um, my first season was wherever, wherever Dave were racing. That's what yeah, I raced. tagged along, yeah. yeah. And then uh, how long was it before you started getting involved with Mick Grant and so things started getting a bit more serious? Uh, so race me on the 83, 84. Uh, got a thing called an NBA, which were the winning 125 at the time, a twin, an Italian twin, brilliant yeah. thing. We got one of them at the end of 84. Race at 85 in British Championship, 86 internationally, European Championship, few Grand Prix. And then at the end of 86, I realised you were never... one two fives. if I wanted to make a living out of it, mm. you weren't going to do it on one two fives in this country. Big, a, big bike mentality in this country. Yeah. Here's a question. Obviously, we were talk, like, talking about when you first started club racing. At what point did that enter your mind, I want to make a living out of this? At what? So you started at 16. Was it like 16 and a half or 20? Uh, or what? By the end of my click? second season, I knew I was... I knew I had some aptitude for it. Yes. But... It was different then. I got into racing because I wanted to be a bike racer. I fan quite fancied it. I thought it might maybe be a bit more attractive to girls. And <laughs> I want to be involved. I saw it as a real exciting thing. And, yeah. you know, the the guys I looked up to were, were bike racers. It, it was a thing. It was a proper nice... And I, I still think that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I still admire bike racers. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I wanted to get involved for that. At no point before I started racing did I think anything other than I, if I can finish, you know, if I can get my name in NCN, MCN at the back where it says, you know, finish third at Cadwell Club Race, that'll do me. So at no point, it's different now. Kids are saying, you know, I oh, know I've got the talent. I mean, it's like the X Factor generation, isn't it's, it? We, we call it Rossi syndrome. Every every kid who gets an OVL or something like from Peter Hickman suddenly yeah. becomes, they're walking around looking like this pillock here yeah. with his sunglasses, <laughs> hair gel on, you know what I mean? Walk around And there were never any of that, you know, it were... That, Exactly. It, so it all happened a little bit at a time for me. I thought, you know, you first, by the end of me, by the end of me first season, I thought, my, because I'd finished, I'd finished that rostrum on with another jacket on. I thought, mm -hmm. I'm all right at this. Mm -hmm. I'm all right at this. I'm, and then you get a bit better, and then you think a bit more, and then you get a bit better. And it, it was all steps. It was never, you know. And was it 1985, the first year you did the Manx on the Kawasaki 250? Was yeah, it? I did Manx. Did Manx and, uh, I was racing 125s at the time, but by then I'd got involved and knew a lot. You gravitate towards... I went to, I'd got to race meetings with Dave Leach, but then you'd look at a programme and, it, you know, them old club programmes are like it. It's a James Whitton, 125 under Huddersfield. Or it might say engineer, apprentice engineer, whatever. You give you a little bit of info, and there were three hundred flipping people at the meeting racing at them in them days. But I'd look and I think, well, a few lads from Huddersfield here and Halifax and Wakefield and a few local lads. 
So then you sort of get to know local lads, and by then you've probably got a circle of six or eight friends locally who either race or mechanic or... And they all had different bikes. They were racing LCs. I was only one in them on 25s, but 350 LC, 250 LCs, 250 Open Class, 350G, Yamaha, you know, TZs. So I had a good circle of friends, and they were going to go and do the Manx. A few of them were going to do the Newcomers race at Manx. And I thought, oh, that'd do me. So I entered the Manx, but I didn't have a bike. So it was on a, a local bike shop. I borrowed a bike off them to go to Manx because I didn't have a 250. And what was your first experience at the TT like? I'd been to watch TT a lot of, a lot of times from late 70s with my dad. So loved it. You can't not like the TT, can you? So, so when you first went there, obviously, you know, when you, you hear the interviews with John McGuinness and everyone, and the, the first time they ever clap their eyes on it, and they just say, I want to do this. Was that very much sat about Bray Hill? Did you just went, I want to have a go at this? This might be the first honest answer we'll ever get of any interview. This is brilliant. No, I don't think I did. I, yeah, that's, that's I didn't, interesting. Again, it, it was a it was a, a kind of step by step thing. My, I was at the end. My generation of first, my three first three or four race years of racing were at the end of the. You will if you were from the north, right? Maybe not if you were from the south of England, but the northerners. If you got good at club racing at Cadwell and and Carnaby and Mallory. You'd do the Manx. Oh. Manx was a step. It was a natural step. It wasn't, am I going to do the roads? Ooh, or no. It was a it step. Wasn't that, yeah, different, it, there wasn't. Like, you did it. That's mm-hmm. what you did. It, it is interesting, because I tell you what, the most successful people have come out of bleeding Yorkshire. Yeah, it, 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 it's a northern you know, thing, isn't it? It's, it's a northern it's thing. It's mad, that, isn't it? And, and, if you, and, and you then, then it. the other <laughs> natural step was, if you did well at the Manx, the natural step then was, TT, there was no choice. Mm-hmm. The choice was made. You know, the choice was, you, you did all right at the Manx, then you did the TT, that was it. And it was, the generation after mine was the one that then started deciding. It, 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 there, was, there seemed to be a sort of change then. Mm-hmm. But before before me, everybody dumped Manx. Rob Mack, Phil Miller, there were loads of local lads that dumped Manx and then TTs. And uh, what, what sort of lap times was it back then? Uh, first time I went, I did 98 mile an hour average on a 250 Kawasaki that probably wouldn't even do 120 mile an hour. So fair play, man. It was all right. That's fair it play, right. isn't it? it? Was, I mean, the two quickest newcomers that year were me and Foggy, uh, but I fell off mm-hmm. and broke my collarbone uh, on at- Thursday afternoon. So I didn't take any further part after. And which the track first- was this at your crash? Alaman. Wow. Fell off at Manx first year there. Where- whereabouts? Uh, bungalow. Ooh, that's fast. That's uh, fast. Not the way I were going around it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, you, it's got a little bit of runoff, but you're going to hit your ass off a curb. There was a sort of gravel turning area that's still there. <laughs> I ended up in the middle of that upside down. Bloody um, hell. Then did 86, 87, 88, and 89 TTs then. But by the time I'd done the. What, t- what age were you at this point? Sorry. So you started 16. I started racing at 16, did my first Manx at um, 18. That was a very quick progression. So that's interesting because the thing is, right, ever since this podcast got going, I'm learning more and more about the detail around the history of racing. Now, I love these conversations because I learn so, so much. Now, you went, you were a road racer before you became famous, shall we say? Yeah, I wanted to do it road, yeah. Yeah, that's Just what I mean. Like. It was, it, that, I remember. That's class. I had a mate called Pete Moore, who I'm still mate with. Pete's in his sixties now. He was just about coming to the end of a club racing career as I was starting mine. Yeah. So he became my sort of early mentor. He'd look after my bike a little bit. He'd, he'd advise me on running it. Then I would get to a meet and he'd do two, three, fifty open races and wouldn't be bothered doing the last one. I said, "Do you want to ride my bike?" Then I'd go change his entry to my name and I'd get on his three fifty and all that. And it was instrumentally me doing all right at racing because he just he kept me going the right way and he knew the job. But he says to me, uh, we, we started talking about Manx and he goes, put it this way, it's like, because at the time we all had road bikes. We all flew about on road bikes. Oh. We were the, we were the generation that had, we passed his motorbike test two days after we were 17, went to his local bike shop and said, oh, I've got this money, I want to go as fast as I can. That's what we did. Mm. Money just meant speed for us. What's the fastest bike I can afford with that? Oh, well, we've got that. Right, I'll have that. So we all had road bikes, and we all mucked about on road bikes. And so he, Pete said to me, he just, Manx is easy to get your head around. He goes, imagine somebody closing 40 mile a road 
from your house to Doncaster and saying, there's nobody coming the other way and you can go as fast as you want. Would you like that? And I went, yeah. bloody right, I would. He goes, that's it. That's what you do. That's all it is. If somebody's closed a load of road off for you and everybody's going the same way around. It's brilliant. So that was, that's sort of how we looked at it. And was obviously the, you were, you were there a very tragic uh, in 89. Obviously, your teammate uh, Phil Meller and Steve Henshaw both uh, lost their lives in yep. the same race. D- do you think that um, sort of brought a early retirement to road racing for you? Yeah, I think that a couple of things. I I think I, I went to the Isle of Man really early in a career mm. when I hadn't really learned how to ride a bike properly and safely at that point. I was still taking massive risks and thought I were invincible. And the, the 89 TT was the one where I thought, I looked at it very personally. I didn't, there was no way I were going to walk away and say, this this job's dangerous, you know, it should be banned. I, I walked away and went, if I keep doing what I'm doing there, because I, I fell off that year as well and got away with it at Quarry Benz, clipped a curb and went down the road at like 120 mile an hour. Jeez. And I remember thinking, if you keep doing the road racing you are gonna have a you're gonna get killed Mm -hmm. so it was a very personal thing for me yeah i never at any point thought anybody else should stop i always thought it was a personal thing you know i here's a quick question for you then do you think obviously you have 18s the age limit for the tt yeah do you think that should be changed in your opinion no i mean no it's really irrelevant why i think now if you would have asked me at 16 do you want mm. to have a go around the Isle of Man? I'd have gone, yep. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I just mean in general. With, no, with, with a bit of experience. Yeah. I think 18 is young. I think that... Because we had James Hillier on, and he was... He, I don't think he said it in exact words, but he was very open about the fact that it is it is a bit young to be going to the he, he TT. The, yeah, the uh, minimum age should be lifted. Just Possibly, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's not my decision, but that is young to go and do the TT. And what you've got... What you've... As you can get an 18-year-old that is so mature that he will know how to manage risk and accept risk if he wishes yes. to do that mm-hmm. and understand what's involved in doing that. Whereas you get some 17, 18-year-olds that wouldn't, you know. Yeah. I, it definitely depends on your class as a rider because you think like Josh Daly went early, even Joey Thompson went early. I'm yeah. trying to think, well, there's James Hind at the Manx Grand Prix. Yeah. You know, it... It's a different class. These lads have got a, a strong, strong pedigree. And it was very much different what, what well, you just think, explained. Going even further on that argument, I look at the classes. There's one, two, I've seen one, two, five riders, one, two, five open class. Bike has about, uh, towards the end of the two stroke era, they'd have mid 50s horsepower and they weighed 70 kilos. These, were, these bikes would do 130 mile an hour. Aye. And. There's 12 and 13 year old kids on them, and I was thinking, we've seen it. I mean, we've, 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 and I just think, do you at, at 13 years old, do you have the mental capacity to understand that you can make a mistake and you will be killed? That's the bottom line, mm-hmm. yeah. D- no, in, in, in essence, do you know what you're that. getting into, mm-hmm. right? It's different playing tennis, you might get a flipping ball in the ear, and flipping, <laughs> but this job even on bikes like that, is potentially very, very dangerous. And, and it's all right a dad's stood at the side of a field watching the kid going around, you know, the motocross dad things, urging his kid on. Because I've known a lot of motocross kids whose dad wanted them to do it. In actual fact... They didn't want to. When they got to 20-year-old and they've left home, they went, I fucking hate it. Mm-hmm. It was shit. My dad used to kick me ass and hit me and I never did good enough for him. And, you know... and And... You don't want that in road racing. Yeah. Because sure. I ain't going to break your collarbone. That's going to flip and squash you is, if you get it wrong at road racing, mm-hmm. honestly. <sighs> so maybe, I don't know. It, it, oh, no, no. It's just, you know, it, these are, there we go. And obviously, you mentioned then going to, off to do European Championships. Yeah. Uh, is that like sort of what we class World Superbikes as now? No, I did uh, from the middle of 80s, well, early 86 onwards, I was doing European Championships on a 125 because that's the only... The choice was then... You go international racing on your 125 uh, at where there were a lot stronger small bike racing mm-hmm. or you get on a big bike. Because by then, four strokes were just about taking over. Mm. Production bikes, super stock bikes, GSX-Rs, FZ-1050 Yamahas. And 
So four strokes were coming. If you, you if you could change anything, what do you well what what do you want to keep? Two strokes or four strokes? If you had to pick one bike left in the whole I'm a two world, stroke man. two stroke man. I, just, I, just, I, I, I don't know if you've been following the news recently, but the MotoGP are actually discussing whether the sh- they might be bringing back two strokes. Sure, yeah, man. Really? no, no, yeah, true. Sure. Well, they've developed a, t- it's to do with hy- hydrogen. Formula One cars the, are going to be two stroke, but it's more efficient. Yeah, but the, all right. And I was, discu- I was discussing this exactly with a lot of my two-stroke buddies, mm-hmm. right, the other day. And they're going, hey, two-strokes are back. We know they will be. They're not going to be back the way we knew them. Not, not cast The only not reason that. Formula One will, and I don't know the details, the only reason Formula One will be going two-stroke is because whatever two-stroke they are going to run is more efficient, more ozone-friendly, more planet-friendly. Right, it's a political thing. It's not somebody at the FAA sat down and going, "I know what we'd like: noisy, <laughs> smelly, smoky motorbike <laughs> engines. Let's run them." Because if it were them, I'd be all fa- in know, favour of it. I know right. it's, it's funny how the the whole two stroke thing got phased out purely on the basis of it being, you know, these sort of like anti global warming, uh, yeah. bad for the environment. Yeah. And then uh, I mean, every, there was massive um, bursaries for diesel engines, and it was like, "Oh, you need to go diesel to save the environment." Now and diesel killing it. Yeah, but ten, it isn't. That's, that's the whole thing. It isn't. <laughs> it isn't. It's Diesel isn't. Switching it, in it like correct, the... correct. And and I tell you what gets me the electric car thing. Right, I am not. I'm not a luddite. I understand that there is a consequence to what we are doing and how we're transporting ourselves around and what we're eating. I I get that. I hate the idea that the the, the seas are filling with plastic bottles. I hate the idea that people will dump stuff out the window just down here on a, on a local personal level. I hate that. Yeah, it's wasteful, isn't it? It's wasteful and it's bad. Well, I mean, so I get all that and I'll do my level best to to to, to pull my weight in that area as I can. Aye. However, the electric car thing, am I wrong in thinking that the electric has to be produced somewhere and still in this country more than half is produced by burning fossil fuels so basically you're not burning it outside your house you're just burning it somewhere else to put in your car through a wire there we are <laughs> but even more and i'm a practical man i don't look at the big overall pictures what i do look at is the practical things and i don't know whether anybody has ever and, and i know i'm going to get shouted out for this because there'd be cleverer people than me saying that there's a system already de- being developed and blah 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 but if you live in on the 14th floor of a block of flats or you live in an apartment building with no garage underneath, where are you going to plug your, your car into? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I'm home, love, just chuck the wire out. <laughs> You'd be like, she's, uh, what? There'd be, there'd be more trip hazards. Cabling more, everywhere. There'd be more claims. Hazards. There'd be more claims. There'd be, Ki- be kids flipping, chopping wires and getting electrocuted because trying to weigh the <laughs> copper in. You, you know, just that's just a practical basis. Yeah. And I know people are going to say, yes, but you're stupid and we're going to have it in every street lamp. And they can't even afford to flip and fix the gas mains here. Never mind put electric to charge your bloody car in every street lamp. Maybe that's going to work in London, but I don't Who know. Who cares I mean, about London? <laughs> It's a, it's a practical it's a practical thing, and you know, I, I think the answer, unfortunately, uh, to it, if it, if transport is the problem, is public transport. Get some good public transport, and then you don't need a personal transporting vehicle. But mm. I mean, I'd, hey, I'm not, I'm not. There a we are. Yeah. Not so, yet. all right, let's let's jump on another quick fire question. What did you make of the TT Zero when it was running? Right, TT Zero, the first year and first couple of years yeah. were exactly. Although there were a lot of things in there that was almost laughable. It was home-built, backyard, weird-looking specials, yeah. right? That's part of the character of the team. Correct. And there was, I think, about 70-odd entries the first time I saw Aye. it. Everything from a home-built thing with a carbon frame that had been, you know, fashioned by a, some kind of flipping mad scientist to a R6 chassis with a flipping big motor and a wagon battery. Right, and and I love that. Everybody having a go, a few failing, you know, and a few. But then what happened is two or three, and the two most notable are uh, Motor Chish, that American thing that were brilliant, and the Mugen, Mugen. got so good and so expensive that all these little people and and schools and and the university, the universities, yeah. and and the you know these they even had. 
big uh, company kind of um, apprentice schemes where they were building a bike to put in. They can't compete, so why no. are they going to compete? Yeah, everyone goes there to win, even if you've got a little wallet or a big wallet. You know, that it's the, the mentality of going racing. So you yeah. couldn't, if they couldn't compete, they didn't compete. Yeah. So eventually it ended up being three really good bikes in one in a race. It's in a one-lap race. Pointless. That's, I think that's, I mean, when looking at the, the TT schedule, and especially with the weather being dodgy over the last few years, you think to run that one lap for the TT, it's maybe like an hour and a half in the in, in the sometimes it's very very short space of time with the weather constraints and p for the fans on the side of the road they're literally watching like three silent bikes go past and then <laughs> looking at the phone just waiting around for maybe an hour and it's 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 about um you no know, for putting a show on for the fans i think they've sort of had to pull it uh, uh for that reason maybe. No, obviously yeah mm. but and it wasn't you know if there'd still be 60 people in the race fine keep mm. it running but but Three bikes. No, it's not good. So what would you... Okay, it's all about development, isn't it? Every sport's about pushing, keeping things fresh. In your opinion, what would the TT... What what could the TT replace that with? And what would you want to see racing around the TT again? Do you want my honest opinion? Yeah. TT doesn't need anything. Fair enough. TT is just... The TT has got that much going for it as a spectator event. Yeah. That it doesn't need anything. Mm -hmm. All it all it needs is fast motorbikes going around roads. They shouldn't really be going around, if we're honest, but because it's been going for hundred and odd years, it's still allowed, and 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 long may it continue. It's it's such a different, oddball, unique event that they'll never. Can you imagine if the TT on the northwest and the Ulster had never and the road race in in other countries as well had never happened, and then but you then there'd never been Came any road racing right ever. And you came up with the idea now. And you went to your local government and says, I've got a great idea. Oh, what is it? Well, we're going to close off 40 mile of roads, right? Which involves, you know, putting, we're going to, we're going to barrier these off and everybody's going to not go on the roads there. And then we're going to have to put bales. There's a little bit of infrastructure to get built up. And then we're going to have a race. And what we're going to do is going to set, we're going to set 60 blokes off down this hill on big, fast motorbikes, and it's the first one back wins. They'd go, <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're probably locked up. But because it's because it's been going on for that long, it's allowed and it's yeah. accepted, and it's a brilliant thing. Mm -hmm. oh. and, and going looking ahead for TT 20, uh, 2020, obviously there's a few changes in teams and, and a few different manufacturers. Obviously Hickman is kind of the man to beat at the moment. Absolutely. Which went from the Triumph to the R6, which yep. is, it has been looking the bike to be on in Definitely that Definitely in that class, yeah. Um, do, do, do you think we could see Hickman do five, five in a week this year? Potentially, yeah. I mean, he's a big lad, big lad for the six hundreds, but he always gets on well with them. Mm -hmm. um, is has he only won one or the Super Sport? I, mean. I think he's only won one Super Sport. Yeah, on the Triumph. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Triumph. Although the Yamaha's the bike to have short circuits, without any question. Now it's the it's it's the newest bike. Yeah, yeah, but they're not making any but, other ones now, are they? No, that's why it's because nobody's making nobody's. But the Triumph's always been a good tool rider, man. Mm -hmm. A little bit talky, it's, you know it. But anyway, um, I think he's definitely going to be the man to beat in every single class, I think. Um, and there's potential... Trouble is, about... Y y the Isle of Man is, even in this day and age, when bikes are a hell of a lot more reliable than what they were even 20 years ago, yeah. you can't guarantee anything in Isle of Man. You can, have, you can run out of fuel, you can... Look what, look what happened have. last year. Exactly. With, like, um, like Har so in your opinion, what's, gonna t what's it going to take to beat Hickman? Because Harrison, now, but Harrison's done a thirty-four point nine. Yeah, he's point six of a mile an hour behind now. Yeah, the way obviously social media and the way magazines and newspapers, it's like Hickman is a different planet. Realistically, Harrison is on the it, clip uh, of him. It, it is definitely Hickman and Harrison are you two, and they are. I mean, if you, they're head and shoulders above anybody else now. I think in terms of what they're Made capable of around there, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. the next level now. And obviously, with the news this week that McGuinness has joined, uh, the Quattro, yeah, the yeah. Quattro Plan Kawasaki team, uh, replacing obviously Hillier. Hillier has gone up to the BMW. Yeah. Do you think after you know, obviously, uh, all the injury that McGuinness has been through after the Honda fiasco, and then obviously having a time on the Norton, which wasn't really competitive, do you think that this could be the step that he needs to be competitive again? Uh, I think it's even more basic than that. I think. On a real personal level with John, I, I speak to John all the time. I'm a really good friend of John. I love John. He's, he's 
it, he's a cult hero. He's he is what he is. Yeah. He's annoying in a lot of ways. <laughs> he's kind of lazy in some ways and really hard working in other ways. He does exactly what he wants to do. He knows what he's is is. Is is an odd man to be doing what he's doing, mm-hmm. but that makes him all the better for me. Yeah. I really like John. I get on really well with him. The whole and I've, world would go nuts if he won another one. Yeah, wouldn't but they? The, with, with John, it's not even about getting him his backside on the bike that he think thinks is the most competitive. It's more about him. It's at least at the end of this, the only unknown quantity going into the TT, the team's known. They've only had one breakdown in however many flipping starts, a lot of starts. Mm. It's run strong with Ilya. It's not like it's had a dolloper on it that hadn't even been revving it past flipping eight. So the team know what they're doing. The team know what they're doing with the fast rider. They know how to run a TT. They know how to run a bike, and the bike's capable. And I think with John, that's important because he needs to know where he is now. Mm. He's had that much time off and that much injury and that much messing about with the note and all that. This will be brilliant for John because... Really, he can, he can gauge himself after the TT this year, which he can't do now. And look what he did at Macau. Bearing mm. in mind, everyone, he, he just wrote him off, didn't he? For yep. the two years, everyone wrote him off. He turned up at Macau and he was he was on the gallop. Like, yep. he, it was like, it was like it, someone well, he, knocked, like, he literally that chiseled 20, 20 looked, years off him. He loved and that he was, bike. He was on. And that's what he needs. John survives entirely on confidence. Mm-hmm. Entirely on confidence. And you would think a man of his age, with his experience and his success, would be completely the opposite. They'd be you think able, you just consistently bang out results. They'd be able to rely on the fact that they knew they could do it. And he questions himself a lot. He's, that's what makes him... He's very fallible, is John, and that makes him lovable, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. You can relate to that. Yeah, relatable. You know, it's... it's uh, And um, so from where we got up to with your career, uh, did you then go... Did you get up to the big bikes in this country, then go to Europe or... Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I didn't buy it because I knew... I knew Mick Grant from being about... 13, uh, a 14, because Mick used to come up here and use a runway just to, you can't do any testing up here, but you can test a gearbox, mm-hmm. you can test a bit of jetting, you can do a plug chop. You practice and, stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we knew Mick uh, as a family. We'd been to watch Mick. You know, when we went to the Isle of Man, me and my dad went in 78, mm-hmm. we already knew Mick because mm-hmm. he'd been up here. So we were, you know, we were Mick Grant fans back then and he only lives, we used to pass his house the whole time. His, his house is sort of five miles from here. Mm-hmm. Well, he lives in Lincolnshire now, but he did live in Huddersfield. And, uh, small world, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, really small. And he came to me in 86 and said, he'd seen me doing some international stuff and he'd been at the same meetings in the UK, some British championship that I slotted in between. And he said, need a big bike. He said, honestly, if you're going to get any further in sport, need a big bike. And he said, I'll get you one. And he went to Suzuki and kind of badgered them into just giving me a bike to shut me up or to shut him up really mm. and um, <laughs> so I went racing a, a class called Superstock which then were the big class mm-hmm. it's not like Superstock now you could do a lot more tuning a lot more mods to your bike in the Superstock class at the time because right. um, they had a production class then which was, that was almost like the stock classes now if you understand Aye. the production class was absolutely standard lights horn everything mm-hmm. the Superstock class was one jump ahead of that almost what we'd call super bike now and then above that, there was F1, which was, mate, run what you brung. You could flip it, put anything. As long as you had, uh, you know, crankcases that was off the original bike, you could basically tune the God bejesus out of it. <laughs> so the, the the super stock class I did was uh, almost like what became super bike, really. And then did you, was it after that that you moved up to the Durex Suzuki? Uh 87 rode my own bike Best with help from me. Best in motorcycle racing yeah, yeah, to yeah. this they day. They weren't that good. Uh, well, the Durex, you, you, you have got much? a kid. Uh, no, no, I don't mean, the, I don't mean product. I mean uh, the fact that they, they didn't, they never put in what, a sponsor never puts in what the name looks like they're putting in. They were a decent sponsor, but they never understood motorbike racing. Um, they were of the time. They have a safety product. Well, it was a massive, at the time, it was a massive age thing. People thought that, that, Condoms were going to be uh, as essential for you know the planet continuing with human beings on it as air, <laughs> and it just didn't turn out like that. But that they were they were bullish. Oh yeah, we're going to have tons of money. Yeah, oh, yeah, we can't, we, you know condoms are going to be everywhere. <laughs> That's what they thought, <laughs> uh, and it was a good sponsor in that people are still talking about it. Yeah, um, yeah. Once at end of eighty seven, 
I'd had a reasonable year, won a couple of superstock rounds, did my first big bite TT, um, and did all right at that. And then at the end of that year, Mick said, right, well, I'm going to run the Suzuki team. They're feeling it out, and I'm going to run it from my place at Lepton, just up here. Mm-hmm. I don't want you to ride. You and Mez are going to be the two riders. So then after that, I really never had me. I'd, I was factory stuff ever since, really. Mm-hmm. So And then... F- uh, did you then make a step to World Super Sport? I did uh, British Championship on Suzuki, then Honda, then Suzuki, then Yamaha, then went into World Superbike. I always, through most of that time, concentrating on British Championships, we'd do one or two rounds of World Superbike. Yeah. I finished on the Rostrum on a private bike in 93 on a fast orange bike. As a one-off, as a wild card, mm-hmm. um, I'd other, and then first full-on year in World Superbike was on a Ducati in '94. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously, you, you're very involved with the World Superbikes nowadays. Yeah. Commentating, you you get to quite a few of the rounds. Yeah. Good friends with a lot of the lads that are racing. Yeah. Of it, it's it's not a patch on what it was in the glory days in terms of the um, the interest and in whatever. What do you think's went wrong for for World Superbikes? Uh, it's a, that's a big, big question. I mean, it, probably for me, the bottom line is if you have exciting racing most weekends, you're going to watch it. People will watch. So, do you think it's just literally the? the I race- think the racing got a bit stayed. I think grids got a little bit small. I think it got regulation. I think the World Superbike organizers whether that be fg sport or since then it's been dawna i think have not kept pace with what where the regulation should be in terms of how affordable it is to do Mm -hmm. Uh, a little bit of that is because the manufacturers have said well we're not getting involved if if there's no electronics we're not getting involved because we use this as a development and i think what they should have done have gone well do you know what lads fuck off Mm-hmm. Yeah, these are the rules. Yeah. We're not having electronics. Much more if that like means, BSB type. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think they still would have been involved. Yeah. I think getting rid of superstock that was a massive, massive problem, mm-hmm. mistake. Yeah, because they could have developed it through that class. They can develop electronics through MotoGP that has everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, silly bugger. They, you know, and I think they've got to make exciting racing. However, they do with that. And I know the organisers have sort of tried different things. They had that grid thing where after the first race it switched. They've had that super yeah. super pole race or whatever they're called. And like each time it's you know a bit gimmicky. Yeah, a bit gimmicky. Um, I've I've heard various suggestions of po- possible things they could try. One thing that I thought was was a really good idea and something very out of the box was to to differentiate world suit of bikes from MotoGP and to increase the viewing numbers is to run it throughout the winter months so it went in hot European like countries southern hemisphere but yeah. to, to get plenty like change the season a little bit and have it through and I th- obviously like if there was oh, racing on this weekend you would definitely be watching like because you'd not you'd not a lot of competition with other meetings yeah and what, what, um, what do you think of that? that's, I would yeah I would that'd be mint that put a word in <laughs> go on William go on put a word in <laughs> I know it's nice for yeah. uh, for the whole racing world to have a little bit of a break, but the world's if, polluted with Love Island at the moment. Bring back petrol engines. <laughs> <laughs> Gas some of them competitors on there. That's it, exactly. Um, <laughs> He's made a note here, Chris. I, think I you've rather hit the nail like on the traditional idea, and it, in recent years, it was always formed around the fact that bi- bikes don't change much now. You get a model change every... Because you're not selling as many road bikes, especially in Europe, especially sports bikes. But they're changing internals, aren't they? Like the they, R1's done that, the Kawasaki's done that. They don't change that. them much. Mm-hmm. They've reached a sort of plateau in what is possible and what is developable and how far you're going to... You know. Right. Whereas with... You know, 20 years ago, a new bike came out every single year from somebody. And so it, it was almost... We're waiting for his new bikes coming in January. Then we got, you know, it was a seasonal thing, even for bikes coming out. Whereas now doesn't seem so. So you could probably get away with racing Southern Hemisphere in mm-hmm. maybe. I mean, we starting we start in February, so it's almost a. But then you have, yeah, a, yeah, you have a big gap. Yeah, yeah. Do, yeah. like what, what? It's a huge gap, isn't it? 
of four or five weeks. Yeah, yeah something yeah, like that. Middle. In racing terms, it's and big, s- isn't it? And speaking of sort of series that were, have been amazing and then they've dropped down, uh, what, what's going on over in America with the, what was AMA, Moto America? Um, do, you, do you follow the racing over there much? Or? A little bit. Um, I mean, at one point, oh, like, there was lo- loads and loads of top American lads. It was like, a, a, like you know, s- similar to like what Spain is now. Yep. And then now, you you know, they're struggling to get anyone in the MotoGP. I know they've got uh, like one or two knocking about. but We're getting an American in World Cup about this year. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we need it. Um, I don't know what's gone wrong there. They used to have a really buoyant championship. I got offered a lot of money to go race there right there towards well, the end of my career. Uh, Neil Hodges, a few people have went over Neil there went and, and did it. There's been Ellison. other people. Ellison carved himself Ellison, that, didn't he? Yeah, he did, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, didn't, who is it as well? Didn't uh, Chas Davies? Chas Davies did a lot of racing there out well. there. Yeah. I, I would look, I tell you what, I started emailing a few people and like, we were briefly touching on this about, you know, the politics and the sport and everything. And I'm only over the last couple of years discovering actually how much it costs to go racing. And I was emailing a couple of people and they wanted 80 to 100 grand. I would go out to America in a heartbeat. You know what I mean? There's trees all over the world. I can get work anyway. <laughs> you know, and it's, I would go out and race there because you, you, you theoretically could make a name. I think someone like you, Chrissy, to put it blunt, mm-hmm. I think you could turn up and mob it. It's very competitive over there still, isn't it? There's, I is think it, at the is front it top, is, yeah. yeah I think front, at the front is, um, yeah. Who's the lad that's gone into World Superbikes? Do you know what? I forgot. I should know <laughs> this. But yeah, about, yeah. Uh, it's even that I can't tell you. Speaking of world superbikes, uh, obviously our our reigning British superbike champion Scott Redden's going over. Yep. Top team, top bike. Yep. Whatever. He knows the circuits or most of them. D- do you think he could win it? Do you think he can take the fight? I think he's. I think he's going to be somewhere near the front. I think. I think he'll win rounds. I think the problem is when you look at what Jonathan Ray's been able to do. Not only has he been the quickest person at most race meetings, but he's been the one that's got the best out of every possible myriad of circumstances. You know, he's he's the one that, if it's wet weather, he seems to be able to get the best out of that. If there's an old up, he gets the best out of that. If there's a... He just... He's a robot. The man's he, a robot. He, he and when, when he hasn't got the pace to win, he's always settled in for seconds. And, and that's why over a season... He wins. He can... Over a season, it's difficult to beat. Mm-hmm. And, but there's some will be him at some point. What do you think it would take for him to move? If you know what I mean. Because he did the MotoGP, didn't he? He did no, no. two or three meetings, didn't he? Yeah, standing mm-hmm. for Casey. Wasn't yeah, it? it's, it was, yeah. A, it's a bit like... And he did really well. Mm-hmm. See, you're like your situation at the moment, MSS. You know, Would you want to go in the Worlds? But even now you know, obviously you're thinking about superbikes. It's about getting on the right bike. Because like... I think Johnny Ray could go get a MotoGP ride again, no bother, but it wouldn't be necessarily... I, I, I think at his, his stage in his career, would he want it? No, he's earning good money, right. he knows what he's doing, he's got a team that... Uh, uh, that uh, the man's a winner, yeah. The efficient, most efficient in World Superbike. Do you, like say, go back five, six years, if he'd if he'd made a move to MotoGP, similar time to Cal Crutchlow, yep. do you th- who, in your honest opinion, who's the best rider between them two? Would Johnny Ray have done achieved more in MotoGP given Cal's rides and experience? Funny thing, isn't it? It's a difficult question, and, and you're always <laughs> going to upset somebody with your answer. But my opinion would be ultimate speed, Cal. Over a season, consistency, Johnny Ray, JR. So yeah, pretty pretty close, but. Mm. Mm, fair enough. And uh, looking ahead to BSB this year, obviously, are you still doing the same role with Eurosport? Yep. Yeah, excellent. Um, who Who's your pick for the, the title? It's a really it's a really difficult choice. Uh, because of what he's on and because it's his second year on it, I, if I had to put money on it, and I don't like putting money on it, I, don't, I mean, they're all my mates, they're all good lads. Mm-hmm. Great championship is BSB. A lot... It's quite a lot changed. We've lost a couple of sponsors, got a couple of new ones in. Um, Brooks. Mm-hmm. He's got a start favourite, I think. And I think he will for most people. I don't yeah. think I'm saying anything. Oh, the, oh no, not at all. We had uh, Christian Inden on the podcast last week. Obviously, yeah. Massive move for him, like yeah. a dream opportunity. Uh, and then, and obviously him and Tommy. Last year, the Ducatis 
dominated the championship if you look at all the stats and like and the race, that's win, change. race wins podiums whatever yeah. uh, and we've also got Gino Ray coming he's on the uh, I think Dave Tyson's running them on a Ducati as well yeah. so we'll have you know a few few Ducatis and hopefully we'll see you know Christian up the top we've got um, Bradley Ray going over to the Tyco yeah Brad, Brad and the Tyco thing but it ain't even Tyco now it's back to Taz because there's no Tyco sponsorship um, wish Brad all the best has he got the talent absolutely but I, I do feel he needed a change. I think that he needs to find out where he is. I mean, he needs to be able, he needs to be able to do what he knows he can do. But he needs to be able to do it every weekend. Not, you know, we know how quick he is. There's no, you, 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 he's got the talent. Aye. There's no question. Um, Christian, I'm a massive Christian Eden fan, mm -hmm. and I believe that Christian will would be quick on pretty much anything. You would never, ever bet against Christian pulling some out of the bag at any meeting, at any circuit, on any bike. Mm. But He's again, like a wild card in this event. But he knows, and I, I've told him to his face, because I see a little bit of Christian, especially during the summer, because he instructs for us a little bit, and he's, he don't live too far away. And I've said, mate, if you're not gonna, if you're gonna do it, it's gonna be this year because you ain't gonna do it if you don't do it this yeah, this, yeah. this year. A, this, he knows it. He's a proper yeah. blow Christian, and he like down to earth, like lovely like, lad. Like, yeah, like, and, it, and he gives himself an hard time, time, you know. Mm. He, he almost overtrains. He, 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 there's nobody puts more into it than him. Than him, mm -hmm. absolutely hundred percent. He's he's a flipping. He's a strong, strong man. Our, our last episode uh, on the podcast was actually called Frozen Testicles, <laughs> and it was named <laughs> after uh, when Christian first started courting up in the northeast. Like some like a winter. Uh, is that during, what we're calling up the there? Court, His girlfriend's it? up there, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, yeah. Dur during the winter, he he cycled up, so it was two hundred and fifty kilometers, like over all the, yeah, the yeah. you know the Midlands, yeah. and uh, he got up up into the moors, and uh, it was uh, like freezing cold. I bear in mind, now the beast from the east. Yeah, he was that doing was that, it during that. that. Time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, had a, he, he was talking about that. Had a good laugh. I stuff. don't think I've known any. I've ever known anybody in any walk alive as fit as him. Mm -hmm. Honestly, he comes and does track days instruction for us, and he will get up. T it's t the typical day is, bear in mind it's summer, so it's light at five o'clock, whatever. He's up at half five. You see him, or you hear him, you hear his motorbike home door, click, shut, and off he goes on his bicycle. He'll do 40 miles. He'll be back, get his levers on, do a full day instruct uh, instructing for us, and then he'll go off and do... 40 or 50 miles at night. He is a yeah, Sounds machine. just like Dom. Oh, shut up, man. I cut in trees, not peddling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that Strong is lad. mega impressive. Well, uh, I, we've kind of... I've, I've got through all of the sort of topics that I kind of wanted to discuss with you. So we're just left... I've written down a few sort of quick fire, uh, yeah, like yes or no, just quick yeah. answers. So first one, in your opinion, who greatest of all time? Hailwood. And you do the next one. Hailwood. There we are. Uh -huh. Your toughest rival for your career. Someone that you thought, oh, shite, he's here. Foggy. <laughs> Foggy. There yeah. You, you Both on and off the bike. <laughs> <laughs> if you could have one bike uh, sort of mounted on your on your mantelpiece, any bike in the world, which one would you pick? I would uh, pick, uh, a, towards the end of the V4 era, Any pick any year you want, Honda. V4, 500, two-stroke, Honda. Mick Doohan's bike, basically. <laughs> Big bang or screamer, not bothered. Yeah, right, I, I don't think this is even on the list, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Who's your favourite co-presenter? Your favourite? If you could be Jack, can it? Jack, there you are, the living legend himself. <laughs> so, uh, you, all, throughout your whole racing career, who was your best teammate? Like, favourite teammate? Uh, I had some mega teammates. Can't really... T I would say uh, the two that really spring to mind are Rob Mack in 93 and... Mackenzie in 96. Brilliant. On the other side of that question, who was your worst teammate? So when you thought, oh, just get away from me, will you? <laughs> didn't, I didn't have any, I didn't have any I want friends with. Um, so, okay, you didn't, okay, not not friends, but who got on your wick the most that you just thought, just, just, just go away? <laughs> Must be no, a canny yeah. list, he's thinking yeah. about it. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough, son. Fair enough. Yeah, Fair I made enough. A, I made a massive effort to get on with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, even I had a I had a teammate with a guy who spoke very little English called Paolo Cazzoli, X125 world champ, and I was teammates with him for a couple of years in World Super Sport for Belgada. And although you know he didn't we didn't converse that much, but what a nice bloke! And even now I'll get the odd really sweet little WhatsApp message off him, a little picture, and how's your kids doing? I, I you know I didn't 
I didn't not get on with any of them because yeah. I made an effort to get on with them. Yeah, I know on. that a lot of riders like Foggy and like other riders, fair play to them, their way of doing it was to make something that you, you know, make yourself not get on with them. Mm-hmm. That was their whole thing. Mm-hmm. Mine was, you know what, we're all right. I, I quite enjoyed my racing. Maybe it should have been harder. Yeah. And hated them all. Bastards. <laughs> <laughs> this might be a tricky one for you. What's your biggest regret in racing? <laughs> Don't get- like having regrets. Um, if you could have your time again in one particular moment, if I could, if I could only change one thing at the end, towards the end of HA, um, Gary Taylor, a guy called Gary Taylor, were running the uh, MotoGP squad or 500 GPs as it was for Suzuki. I was racing Suzuki's in the UK, and around about end of HA, at the beginning of '89, I was offered a one-off ride on a 500 teammates to Schwantz. And me and Mick Grant sat down, discussed it. And at the time, our mindset was, look, a one-off ride is never going to work. These things are bastards to ride. You're going to hurt yourself. Let's wait until the end of this season. By then, you will be in a good place to say, look, I want a full season on it. And we said, right, no, we're not going to do it. And it never happened because I broke my my leg at the end of that season and it just didn't happen again. Mm. And looking back, I should have thought, do you know what? Might never happen again. I'm doing it. Yeah. And that's the only thing, really. Yeah. And even that, I don't look back and, and you know, I'm not, I, I never... You're not dwelling on it. No, no. It is what it is. No, but... No, I mean, good. you know, people look back on the a career of any sport and they'll go, or any career, and say, oh, I should have done that, and I were better than him, I were better than him, and he made a lot of money. Ah, yeah. I, I, I sit back and I think, <laughs> I did all right. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else is at home thinking, I, I, I wish did I did what Whitten did. I better than I thought I would when I started anyway. Yeah, so, there you are. Yeah. Bloody hell. Go on. Oh, well, uh, hardest team boss you ever raced for? He gets along with everyone, but in your opinion... Mick Grant. Mick Grant, right. But that made him one of the best as well. Mm-hmm. Hard little fella. Uh, driving you. Hard, hard little fella and, and, and didn't like excuses. And uh, yeah, hard little fella, but good. There we are. Right. right, you're sitting up there with Jack. You're commentating on a race. What was your most outstanding moment that you've commented, like commentated on, you thought this is the best race I've ever witnessed. Uh, without any question, it was my first ever commentary job, and it was I'd raced in the Super Sport race, and it was the second Superbike race that day. It was Imola. It was 2002. It was Edwards and Bayliss going for the World Superbike Championship. It was the last round of the year. It was going to go to one of them. Zaus Bayliss had to get Zaus involved because he couldn't afford if Bayliss Bayliss could have probably gone and win it won it but he needed Zaus to be second and Edwards to be third for Edwards not to win it and it was the thing the race it unfolded at Jack was then sat in with um, Neil McKenzie and they'd asked me look if you feel fit after your super sport race come and be a third mic third yeah. voice you get on with Neil you've been his teammate before you get on with me and it, we're having a bit of banter anyway and the race it unfolded was just spectacular will we find that on YouTube we must do everything's yeah, on YouTube it's, it's, it's the, we're, we're the recognised put- best Superbike race ever. The, We're putting the that psychology on the involved. Bayliss got to the front and looked like he could easy win it, but he couldn't afford it. So he, he had to keep holding Edwards up to let Zaus catch up. And it would just, you knew what was going on and mm. you just didn't know what were, how it was going to end up. And the funny thing was, I'm putting me Tupmersworth in and trying to be a commentator, not knowing really what we're doing. I'm basically having a laugh with Mackenzie. And about halfway through the most exciting race I've ever watched in my life, Mackenzie got up, took his took his headphones off and said, uh, I've got a flight to catch you, I'm off. <laughs> and just fucked off. Yeah. And so Jack went. <laughs> and I'm sat, so I'm sat in, by then I'm like, oh, I'm, I am proper co-commentator you're, then, yeah. <laughs> you're proper committed. Because he, he, the race had been delayed a little bit and he had to go and catch a ah, flight. Right. So he just, we didn't fall out, he just had to go. <laughs> so we've, we've actually got Jack lined up to come on as a guest of the podcast, which I'm really looking forward to because he, you know, he's such a nice bloke. And so if, the, able, if you want to get any digs in, get them the, in now the, before. The duo, <laughs> the duo between you and Jack in the commentary booth, it, you, you just both... Um, Oh, we've had some mega moments. Sort of ban- we've had some such good moments. And so we've had well. some really good moments when we've been out there, you know, just some f- such funny things about him. Jack's, well, Jack's Jack. Jack, yeah. Jack, you can't... He actually told us a few stories about uh, in the higher car, like getting lost off maps with you and just driving about. And... But he, Jack is, of, um, in a lot of ways, he's, he's, he's of the past, but in a lot of ways, he's so savvy. Uh, he he doesn't trust sat-navs, really. Because I, I will take me... Uh, 
I, I take a little mobile thing. We've all got it on his phone now anyway, um, but I, in the day before I had a phone that had a, a proper uh, app on it, I took my little Tom Tom and I just throw it in my bag and when we get there, plug it in and we knew how, we knew we were going to circuit. But he'd say, why, why, we don't need that. I can get a map and he'd get a map and on the plane he'd be drawing little lines and flipping and it always worked and it became a, it became a thing. So I enjoyed his route finding that because typically I'd drive. He don't like driving abroad. He will. Yeah. But typically, I'd drive. He'd navigate, and Jack uh, Pernickel, the pirate, just <laughs> brilliant, around. just absolutely brilliant. We would be in flipping f- barnyards and chickens jumping out of his way and back streets, and he's going, "Oh, it's right, it's all right, it's easy." <laughs> and we always got there, uh-huh. and it, it, it got that much fun that I'd stop taking me Tom Tom. Oh, just that's be class. Just, we had some really good runs. Mm-hmm. It's uh, probably my favorite favorite standout moment of yourself and Jack in the commentary booth was I think it was back in Croft and uh he was commentating along and you I know the one and uh Victor Cox, Cox. <laughs> mm. I love to see Cox bouncing around <laughs> and I went and he's just said that on air and I went and he went he goes and you've got a lazy button and if you press it it means he can hear you but it doesn't go out to air so well, obviously. I pressed my lazy and I went so you love to see Cox bouncing around <laughs> It was like that, and it, 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 it shoved him sideways. He couldn't, it, it was so good, that. But he did another one. There was a guy, I don't know if you remember him, a bloke called Brian Clark, right? I think he's still in Paddock because I think he runs a bit of a team. But Clark, he used to be a really good 125 rider and a lovely lad. Quite older end then. He was up against a lot of... Well, 125 class were typically... Then, I loved the 125 class. It was the last two-stroke class. Typically then, it was... Uh, a few older guys and a load of young lads and and like Luke Edger and 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 James Lodge and all them kind of people coming through. But you got a few old stages in there as well who could mix it with Kyle Ride and you know. Rob anyway, and yeah. yeah. So Clark Clark is going really well and Clark he, top six, top seven, he's front runner. But he only has one eye. <laughs> he lost his he lost one of his eyes as a kid. Is he Irish, Brian Clark? I'm no, like, he's not Irish, is he? Oh, I'm getting one-eyed it. Irishman sounds like a bad joke. It's about but anyway, that, yeah. he's um, he, but he's such a nice lad. But he's quite an aggressive little rider. Typical sort of mild-mannered sort of assassin, you know. There's plenty of in racing. That's why I, one of the reasons I like racing. You can be weird anyway. Um, and and he's, he's he loved Clarky, did uh, did Jack, and he's he's going on and on about him when this one two five race is going on, and he said, oh, he's you know he's. You'd be surprised. You see him in the paddock, and he's so soft and mild mannered and lovely. But uh, you know, when he gets his helmet on, he'd give you know, and you look at you look through that visor, he will give you a steely stare. And I went, <laughs> and then he looked, he looked back, and he went, <laughs> with the good eye that is. <laughs> <laughs> that cracked me up because oh, people at home wouldn't have a clue anyway. Yeah. That's the they thing. Wouldn't know. They'd be going, what do you mean this good eye? Yeah. What about this? But, yeah. Good. Let's t- class, man. Tell you what, last last question to finish it off. So, a current racer that's uh, you know any class now uh, rings you up and says like the missus has just kicked us out. I, I need I need to move in with you for a bit. If if you could pick one one current rider that you would like that to be to move in with you, who would you pick? The thing is, right, you'd be going off. You'd be going off what you think you know about them, and you know yourself, especially blokes. You go on holiday. You first time you go on holiday with all your mates, who you love to bits. You don't get on with half of them oh, on, on, in, 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 when you're in a close sort of circumstance with them. You know what I mean? <laughs> one of them will snore. One's flipping stinking. One's left the flipping butter knife in the jam. You know what I mean? You're like fucking hell. <laughs> and it, it, so you don't know, do you? You're only going off what you think you know about them. So I don't know a lot of them that well. Um, I would say. Well, you want somebody who's clean and tidy, don't you? Mm-hmm. And I, a music would piss me off. If they listen to that modern music, that would piss me off. So I, I would go... It'd have to be Sex Pistols or nothing. <laughs> I'd like a bit of 80 stuff. So who's a bit retro there? One of the, who are the younger ones that are a bit retro? I would go... Oh, he's narrowing this down. This is good. I think... I'd go Kyle Ride, you know. So I like Kyle... I think he's a, I think he's a good bloke, and I think he's a little bit malleable still. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Plus, he always has good-looking girls, and there'd be a few of them <laughs> tripping about it. I, 
I'm, uh, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to seeing how Kyle gets on with Keith Farmer, obviously. Build I am, yeah, yeah, stuff. I am. Be, be all good K- Kyle's another one of the... And in actual fact, Kyle and uh, Brad were real good mates going through the mini moto days. And to me, they're almost equally talented. Um, Kyle, I would say, is a little bit more fragile, needs things just going his way. But there's no doubt if he can get a team and a bike doing what he wants, he's up there. he'll be fast. Mm. He's never been slow when things have gone his way. Yeah, Right, that's the BSB paddock. Quickly, in the roads paddock, who would you pick? What, to live with? Yeah. <sighs> Do you know, I like John McGuinness best, but you know he's a slob. <laughs> Oh, that, that's be minion, wouldn't it? <laughs> there'll be tractors all packed. Aye, Mind, there is be, anyway. There'll be, that's it, aye, there'll be beer cards uh, everywhere. There'll be a, pro, a bachelor pal, I can imagine. Oh, that's a hard one. I think he's going to go back. It's full circle Dino. John. Dino. 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 Aye, Dino baby Dino, I think. You can talk about engines and all sorts too, lads. So there you go. Yeah, that, well, that, with Dino, that'll be the problem. It might just get a little bit... Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, we really, really so appreciate much. it. No problem, boys. Welcome, welcome us in. Just a quick shout out. Big thanks to uh, Ian Stanton and Kev Pinder for sending us some good questions through along with our patrons. And uh, we're actually on a bit of a, a podcast tour at the moment. So we've got a few good guests lined up. Who are you we'll coming be, up? So we've got um, later on this afternoon, we're doing a guy called Aidan Robinson. Who is he's, a chiro- he's literally made people walk again. I mean, the chiropractor, loads, but he's like, you'll know loads right. of people that go to the scene, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of fixes That'd people. That'd be a good yeah, and then, uh, like a more of a uh, yeah. technical side of it. Planning on going down to see Phil Crow. Uh, oh, Phil Crow's good lad. And, Do you know he's uh, buying a bike for uh, Jenna this year? Is well, that who he's going for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. brilliant. Phil Crow's brilliant. And he can ride a motorbike. I tell you what I like about him is he just he he's a big scary guy, but he just doesn't run his mouth. It's lovely. And that's what I mean. I don't, like, I'm in the same paddock as him. I mean, if there's a pub fight kicks off, you're you one, want to be on his side, one. not the other side. <laughs> and, he defi- right? and he defies physical he came, laws of speed. I remember he? doing a track day that he booked on one of our track days, but we don't know everybody who booked on our track days ah. back then. All I know is I was instructing this rather fast guy in the fast group of one of my track days, cladding on. We were, we were, we were peddling around Cadwell, passing most people, and this thing, <laughs> came past me at the end of the bottom straight going up into copies and I thought what the hell it was a 25 stone comedy man going like stink and it's serious. at that point I thought I've got to find this bloke got to find yeah, this he's, man he used to ride it like a, like a mini moto you couldn't like see the motorbike yeah, yeah. Well, well, why doesn't he wait, he doesn't do British it does a few wild cards and stuff but yeah. his main focus these days is the TT but anyway we've got him and uh, we're going to that's right next to where the Neve lads live. Yeah. So I, we're going to see if they're free and they're popping and do, maybe do a quick interview kids. with them. And then I, I, I tell you what, I'm not, I'll am not. i save the other interviews for a bit of a surprise because I don't want to give too much away. But we've got a few more lines. Brilliant. Oh, no, 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 so I don't want to spoil anything. If uh, you yeah. get a chance, um, Roger Marshall, get a Reg one. He's still in British Championship Adam, paddock. Adam Marshall's dad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there well, we are. Roger Marshall is, uh, he, he's like basically if you knock somebody off, you go and see him. Yeah, but he's also 12 times British champion. In his day, riding big old four strokes there. and early two strokes, mm-hmm. mega he'll, he'll and like the full spectrum. You'll get him going, <laughs> and he will not pull any punches. Honestly, he's flipping great. Oh, anyway, thanks, well, boys. Thanks, 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 thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.
Nej, vi ved det. <laughs> Magnifies everything. We're not having sex, I haven't got me glasses. Oh man.